So I'm a physicist. Uh, I work a couple of buildings over um, at Monash uh, Quantum Information Science, or MONKEYS. Um, and since we're quantum mechanical, we have the compossibility of a banana not being eaten and being eaten at the same time. <laughs> so, um, so let me let me motivate um, the topic by starting uh, with uh, classical computation. Um, so, in computation. Uh, I'm not really a computer scientist, but uh, I, I, I do play around with it a bit. But we can think of a computation as we start with the computer that's blank. Um, we have a bunch of gates that are acting on our, our, our bits, which are initially all zero because the computer is uh, blank. So, and, and, and these gates have programmed the problem and, and an algorithm to solve that problem. And end of the computation, uh, we get uh, another uh, a string of bits which uh, uh, have some information or the solution, potential solution to the problem, and it's just uh, encoded in zeros and ones. And that's a very simple model for uh, classical computation. So how does that differ from quantum computation? Well, not a whole lot in, in, in this picture. The only thing that I've done here is I've changed um, those zeros and I've put these funny symbols around them. Um, they're called cats. So I've, I've changed my bits into into uh, uh, zero cats, and then at end of my computation, I have uh, cats that are either zero or one. So it looks identical. So what gives? Well, um, technically, what we've done is we've changed bits into qubits. And what that implies is uh, a bit which can take value of either 0 or 1 can now take uh, a continuous, uh, can have a continuous state which could have any uh, uh, superposition of, of uh, the qubit in state, quantum state 0 or quantum state 1. So both of those can exist together. It's like the banana that was eaten and not eaten at the same time. Um, <clears throat> now, that simple, um, so, so this is sort of a simplistic way of looking at it. In fact, what we have is a, a, a superposition of all the possible, um, uh, many of the possible bit strings um, uh, with, uh, with, with complex coefficients. And this turns out to lead to a, um, a, a speed up of computation. So going from that initial blank state to the answer state, uh, we can get there um, at times exponentially faster. And, and this, this is sort of the remarkable thing about quantum computation, that, that it, uh, if, if, if the laws of computation are, are, are um, restricted by the laws of physics, then, then this is sort of the ultimate uh, computer that we can construct. Uh, a famous uh, uh, example for uh, a, for quantum computation is Shor's factor factoring algorithm. So there is no known classical algorithm for factoring large numbers into uh, the prime finding its prime factors. But uh, you, if if we had a quantum computer, uh, then we would be able to uh, factorize large numbers. So um, quantum technologies supposedly allow us to uh, build faster computers. But uh, more than that, we, can put, we, we may even get better sensors um, through different mechanisms in quantum technologies. So uh, if we wanted to measure, say, the magnetic field, we can do it uh, with far more precision using a quantum system than a classical system. Uh, it can allow us. Uh, uh, secure communication um, and it turns out to be um, unconditional uh, secure communication so there is no way to um, break the security of it. Now all of these things are rather hard. None of them have been realized in a practice. Proof of principle realizations have been done for the last uh, 15 to 20 years but um, no one's built a quantum computer or a quantum sensor or a uh, 
uh, quantum communication uh, uh, setup that can be used. Although these things are happening, Google has uh, is investing a uh, hundred million dollars uh, towards quantum co computation. There are um, uh, companies that are um, that have started making uh, um, uh, uh, systems that can do quantum communication and 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 similarly for quantum sensors. So often in quantum information science, we, we, we are wondering what else can we do with quantum mechanics that we cannot do classically. And this is sort of where this problem started um, several years ago when we were just playing around with, uh, with uh, some questions of thermodynamics and in context of quantum physics. And we were asking, what can, can we do here that is different? Um, and Another way to phrase this question is, how does uh, energy behave in quantum theory? D does it do anything differently? And so we, invest, we, inv we were playing around with this idea, uh, uh, myself and some colleagues um, in Europe. And, and, and this is the setup that we, we came upon eventually. So imagine we have a quantum system. Uh, let's say it's a spin down system. It's in a low energy state. And what we want to do is uh, 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 put energy into this system so, so we, we somehow get it up to an excited state. Quantum mechanically, the way you do that is through a unitary operation. Uh, and uh, unitary is uh, uh, an exponential of a Hamiltonian, uh, which, which Hamiltonian is dealing with energy. Uh, uh, this, this, unitar this unitary operation is applied for some time. Practically speaking, that's like sh uh, shining a laser onto, uh, onto an atom or, uh, or turning on a magnetic field. And, uh, and uh, by turn if you turn on a magnetic field in the right direction, the spin will go from down to up yeah, uh, it, uh, while it's uh, taking some time. So this operation puts energy onto the system. Uh, and so we can ask questions, uh, semi-thermodynamic questions like work and so on. So um, suppose we have a setup where we have n spins and uh, we're charging them all independently. Uh, in other words, we put some big magnetic field there and we charge them. Then we can ask how much work do we do if we, go, if we take them all from uh, a low, uh, a low energy state to high energy state, well, work will go as n in, in appropriate units. Uh, and if we were to ask the same question for power, um, well, if, if uh, the magnetic field is just there acting on all of the spins at once, then, then, then uh, uh, it will take the same amount of time to uh, charge uh, one spin as uh, uh, n spins, so the power will also go as, go as n. However, it turns out that we can do something more. We could, instead of, um, instead of putting on boring magnetic field, we could put something a little bit more sophisticated, and I'll explain what that, what that is in a minute. Um, but if we, if we can imagine we can charge them all together, all the spins, we can take them collectively from, uh, the, ground, uh, from the ground state to excited state, then what happens is, well, the amount of work we do is the, still the same because we still start in all, all spins in, in low energy state and they all go up to high energy state. So, so the amount of work is the same. But, but it turns out that we can, we can get there uh, much faster. We get there um, um, in, in quadratically less time. So we get quadratically more power. Um, and the, the type of state it looks like, um, it's a little bit better color. Um, so we get a state along the way that looks like every spin is in the ground state and in the excited state at the same time in some superposition with some coefficient alpha and beta uh, that are a function of time. And the fact that they, they go into this joint superposition um, uh, somehow allows them to go from from this initial state to this final state, and if we think about it in terms of uh, um, uh, in terms of a, um, a, a, a geometric problem, we want to go from this state to this state. 
normally we would have to take this path but when we uh, for for uh, n of these spins but when we when we take them uh, when we charge them together they go through some path that is sh much shorter through the center to just give you an intuition so so what we found here is that there is some thermodynamic quantum advantage that goes as n. Um, this is a fairly straightforward calculation. There was nothing exciting there, but, um, um, uh, but, but somehow it's profound that quantum mechanics allows for greater charging power when many systems are charged together. When energy is deposited onto many systems jointly, that it, it somehow collects energy faster. So um, you have to be, one has to be careful in, in doing uh, such things. Um, for instance, making mistakes like this, that shouldn't be there. So I was not careful earlier. Um, so um, this, this U doesn't belong here, so ignore that. So uh, in, in both cases, uh, in, in case when I'm, uh, when I'm taking spins for, uh, in, uh, one at a time from ground state to excited state, or when I'm doing it collectively, in both cases, I'm starting in a, in, in a ground state, and I'm going to an excited state, and this is happening through unitary dynamics. Now, there is a difference in the way the generator of this unitary looks like. In this case, it just you, uh, some Hamiltonian acting on, uh, so I, I here call it parallel. I'm just doing um, these guys uh, charging each one uh, independently, but next to each other. So the parallel Hamiltonian is just ha uh, Hamiltonian acting on each uh, spin independently. In the bottom case, um, I, I have this kind of interaction, but I also have terms like spin one and spin two are interacting spin 2 and spin 3 are interacting, spin 1 and spin 3 are interacting. Similar, uh, and, and then more complex terms like where spin 1, 2, 3 are interacting all together, and then spin 2, 3, 4 are interacting. So I, I'm allowed to have all sorts of weird interactions, all sorts of joint interactions here. But, um, but of course one could, uh, one could simply, if, if, if this Hamilton and this Hamilton are not related to each other, one could simply take a Hamiltonian which has sort of larger magnitude and, and you know, if, if, I, if I think of this thing as a number, if I increase that number, then, then the time it takes for charging decreases. So one, ha one has to constrain this problem by saying that at no times the, the joint charging has en more energy than the parallel charging. So, the joint charging, it's allowed to have interactions, but not uh, uh, more, more average energy. Okay. So then, um, um, then let's make things a little bit more complicated. So imagine we have four batteries. Um, um, we, could have, we could have a situation where uh, we have interactions between all of the batteries, or we have interactions between just two batteries and other two are sitting there. Or we can have interactions between these two batteries and these two batteries. What 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 is the physically meaningful uh, quantity here? Well, for four batteries, the most generic interacting Hamiltonian will have all of these terms, where where this term implies that all four batteries uh, are interacting with each other. Okay. Uh, feel free to ask me questions. I know I'm changing language between spin and batteries. A spin is just a type of a battery. Uh, battery being now more generic quantum system that goes from low energy to high energy state. So now if we were to put some physics into this problem, it turns out that physics doesn't allow for things that, allow, that uh, doesn't allow for four uh, particles interacting with each other. These things are somehow forbidden. Physics, uh, so, so we should probably drop that term. We shouldn't not allow something like that. And we should probably also drop uh, interactions between three batteries because those are also not allowed. Um, and moreover, um, if the batteries were say laid out in some, some series, then we should only allow interactions between neighbors and not between distant neighbors. So I mean, I'm not able to talk with uh, 
with my colleagues in physics building right now because they're far away. I'm able to talk with you. So uh, physics, uh, and, and that has to do with physics. And, and so the same li limitations apply to fundamental particles or quantum particles. Now, so, so, so if we drop these things, then what does it mean for quantum advantage? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, um, I, this is just an illustration, but if I, had, uh, if I had a million particles, then I certainly wouldn't have a term that where all million particles are interacting with each other. But maybe I have a low probability event where four particles are interacting with each other. So, so that probability uh, for, for, uh, for that interaction is going to drop very rapidly as more, more, more things are interacting with each other. Um, now, if we look at the quantum, if we look at the, the quantum advantage, where where, where uh, if we look at the situation where we had this quadratic quantum advantage in charging, it turns out that it comes from a term that looks a lot like this, where all particles are interacting with each other, and so that's not that's not much fun. No, but nevertheless, I mean, um, you know, in in quantum computing. Uh, in quantum computing, what we normally want to do is we want to apply some big unitary operation to our 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 uh, qubits, and then uh, that unitary operation gives uh, 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 leads our qubits into a in, into a state that gives us the answer to the problem. And the way we normally do that is by applying local unitaries. We don't apply a large unitary because, again, the restriction of not being able to interact lots of things at once. So, so the battery problem looks a lot like a quantum computer problem where we charge with a bunch of batteries that are in low energy state, and then we can apply maybe some unitary operations on, 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 on some subset of batteries, then a different subset, and these guys, these unitary, they're, they're matrices, they don't commute. So, so as as we as we apply successively in in this fashion, we 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 could, in principle, generate any complicated unitary, and so our our initial guess was that we should be able to charge um, n quantum batteries and still have some sort of a quantum advantage. Maybe it won't go as uh, as uh, as n square, but some function of n. Um, so we try to formalize the problem like this. Uh, we say that we we write down the the total interacting Hamiltonian with a label k, so it's a k local Hamiltonian, um, and the Hamiltonian has some summation over local operators uh, with index mu, where where this this uh, little eight sub uh, mu given j uh, uh, with uh, su superscript j means that at most j parties are interacting with each other in that term. And now if we set the condition that j is always less than k, which is much less than n, then it means that, that, um, that we could have a very large number of uh, quantum particles or quantum batteries, but at, at any time only uh, some small number are able to interact with each other. So you could have a, a, a some k particles interacting here, another k particles interacting here, and so on. And within this restriction, so this is a very physical restriction, can we still get a quantum advantage in charging? So that's the mathematical question we're asking. Now, the, um, I'll give you, uh, I guess, sort of a snapshot of what the answer seems to be, that we have very strong evidence that this answer, this is what the, uh, this is what answer is. We don't have a formal proof yet, and this is why I'm throwing it out here. Uh, we think that the quantum advantage in a, in a setup like this can at most go as k, not n. Okay, so that's, that, that we think is the answer, and we have, some, uh, we have something that looks like a proof, but it's not quite there. Formally, we could, um, we could set up the problem something like this. So this is the approach that we've been taking. Um, so what we what we care about is uh, putting a upper bound on the average power 
for when we're uh, charging all uh, all these particles together. That average, so that's average over time. Okay, that average power is always less than the maximum instantaneous power at, at any given point, and that um, instantaneous power, which is just the expectation value, uh, uh, it's the time derivative of the the expectation value of the energy can be written as the instantaneous state, uh, the expectation value of the instantaneous state with the commutator of the charging Hamiltonian to the internal Hamiltonian. And we'll call that term R. Um, and then there is a constraint, the constraint that says that we can't have our charging Hamiltonian for, for uh, oh, oh, n parties um, uh, have more energy than, than the local charging Hamiltonian. So that's the constraint, and we want to somehow optimize uh, that constraint with res uh, We want to somehow opti optimize this power with respect to alpha mu, which are the parameters that uh, that uh, um, uh, th that uh, uh, that uh, define what the charging Hamiltonian is. Now the constraint is something very easy to write down. It, it, it's extensive in the number of parties, so it goes as n or square root of n, depending on, and, and on your choice. So it's a very straightforward thing to uh, deal with. So, so it, it's just a matter of being able to solve some optimization problem like this, and we seem to be stuck with that. Um, or right, we're close, but we're not quite there. So this is um, this is the problem. Um, have I gone 20 minutes? Okay. I'll, uh, I could add one more thing. So I, the, the, the main, so this is a side project. The main project that I'm working on is um, understanding um, what, are, what is called non-Markovian dynamics of quantum system. And, and uh, uh, the, 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 that occupies most of my time. And that's a mathematically very interesting problem. It, it, it involves, uh, uh, a great deal of tensors and and uh, uh, statistical physics and and so on. So I'll stop with that. <laughs>